Good afternoon, markets. Now, markets in the Asian region traded mostly higher ahead of the Jackson Hole Symposium in the United States, while Hong Kong's session resumed in the afternoon after trading was halted due to a typhoon warning. Stateside investors are also waiting for key economic reports scheduled to come out later, including the jobless claims figures. Meanwhile, Brent crude is heading for a weekly gain, a sign of a tightening supply outlook offset concerns over an economic slowdown. Investors are also monitoring progress on the revival of a nuclear deal with Iran, which could lead to a surge in flows from the OPEC member. Meanwhile, locally, miner Sabanya Stillwater reported a 50% slump in its half-year profit after a three-month strike at its gold mines and floods at its uh, U.S. Platinum Group metal operations cut production. Well, to get into the actual week that was as we get uh, closer to the end of the week and also unpack what is happening from a markets perspective, we are joined by Kanet Fund Sales and Investment Analyst at APSA Asset Management. Kanet, thank you so much for your time. It's green across the board when you look at our local markets. What's driving that sentiment right now? Yes. Hello, Nastasia. So, yes, the all share up about 70 basis points as we're speaking at the moment. The rand strengthening about 16 rand 80 to the dollar the last time that I checked. And I think that that is on a bit of dollar weakness heading into Jackson Hole, but also probably on in line inflation numbers that we got here yesterday in South Africa. Maybe the market was expecting that inflation would have spiraled out of control a little bit. And it's across the board, all of the sectors contributing to a positive performance there. Um, NASPASH and process especially up more than 4%. And that's on the back of some positive share price movements on 10 cent in Asia earlier today. Uh, international markets sort of flattish, as you mentioned. Although it does look that um, in the U.S., the Nasdaq and the S&P might be opening on a positive foot. So from a local perspective, I mean, if you look at SENS, there were a whole host of, uh, you know, company earnings that were out, the likes of Distel, Sabania, etc. Which earnings caught your attention? Yes, yeah, so a busy day this morning. Um, we can touch on the big ones. I looked at Sabania earlier this morning. Earnings were down, as you mentioned, of 49%. Um, but the stock is up. I think that were, that it was guided to the market. It is on the back of production losses in the gold operations here in South Africa, where they had some strikes. And there were also some flood damage in the U.S. operations, which dampened um, production in this reporting period. It was for the six months until the end of June. But from this point onwards, I think guidance is for production to pick up again. And PGM prices are up today. So Sabanya up about 3% the last time I checked. The other one was Goldfields that also reported this morning, again, earnings for the six months until June. That was actually a pretty strong result. Um, operating earnings were up, production was up. That was on the back also of stronger gold prices coming through. And they are actually declaring um, about a 40% increase in dividends, which is always welcome. They are going to embark on a roadshow to try and convince shareholders to still acquire that Canadian business, Yamana um, Gold. So that is coming out from them. And then I suppose maybe one interesting one, a smaller stock, Italtile. They reported this morning, uh, this was full year results for the 12 months to the end of June. Headline earnings up 9%, dividends also up 9%. I think given a tough environment here in South Africa, that was a good performance. So those are some of the ones that looked interesting this morning from our side. Which is a nice segue into my next question. I mean, what do you make of South Africa's earnings or results season so far? Were there any surprises for you? So no real negative surprises. I think generally speaking, the, the numbers, especially out of your SA Inc. focused companies, have been strong. Um, you'll recall over the last two weeks, we had some of the heavyweight financial companies reporting, the banks reporting, all of their earnings up more than 20%. Increases in dividends, I've just mentioned Italtal. So generally speaking, from a local perspective, especially our local companies, I think in a very difficult environment, are posting quite good earnings. And then you take it stateside where going into Q2 earnings, uh, a lot of analysts were expecting to see some kind of, uh, you know, negative statements or even guidance. And that hasn't really materialized with these uh, earnings. I mean, are you expecting a correction at some point on the state side or are you worried about corporate America at all? Yes, I think um, just given higher interest rates, higher inflation globally and in the U.S., 
um, you can expect that, that earnings growth and economic growth, and we have seen economic growth slowing down already, but it has got to slow down. But if you take that into what's in the market price at the moment, going from about um, sort of the end of Feb to just before uh, maybe mid-June, you actually had a w the worst couple of months on the S&P 500 in many years. Yes, we've seen a bit of a, a rebound, but I think a lot is in the price already. Similarly, here locally, I mean, the all share, even despite a bit of a recent rally recently, you know, it's still down 5% here today. So to see a material share price or market correction from this point onwards is is hard. Um, that said, I will definitely remain cautious because, like I said, there's higher interest rates, higher inflation, although it does look that possibly in the U.S. that it has peaked. The last print was, was you know, lower, albeit still high. And then Europe, um, I mean, they are still in the doldrums. The economic numbers and the prints that, and the inflation numbers that we're getting out of Europe are still very, you know, very negative and, and they are still struggling there. So still risks abound, but there are opportunities, companies that are trading on, on very, you know, attractive valuations and where the fundamentals are strong. And there are definitely buying opportunities if you find the right assets. Well, waiting Fed Chair Jerome Powell's uh, comments at the Jackson Hole Symposium, what will you be listening out for? Yes, yeah, so the main um, question I think that investors have at this point is how hawkish the Fed is going to be from this point onwards. We know that we are in a tightening cycle and we know that they are hawkish given the, the inflation number in the US. But um, that said, the last print, as I mentioned earlier, came in lower and we are hopeful that inflation has peaked in the US. So the question is from this point onwards, how hawkish are they going to be? Are we going to see another 75 basis point hikes in the state? Or could we possibly be looking at 50 basis point intervals from this point onwards? And if there has been any adjustment to how long this tightening cycle will last, I think any indication that they can be less hawkish than initially expected or where we can see slower interest rate hikes from this point or a, sh a shorter tightening cycle will be positive for markets. Whereas if there's a big expectation for another 70 basis point um, hike, and bear in mind the US economy is holding up very well from an unemployment rate, strong job market, so they can still hike interest rates aggressively if they yeah. want to. If that comes through, you will probably see a bit of a negative um, reaction on the market. So the question is how hawkish from this point on. Connette, thank you so much for your time. That is Connette from Sale from Absa Asset Management. Meanwhile, uh, drinks maker Distel reported a 36.7% jump in annual profit uh, as consumers continued to uh, buy into the brand. Of course, they did mention that uh, they had supply chain issues, which they are hoping to smooth out in the next 12 to 18 months. I spoke to CEO Richard Rushton for more. I think a, a standout performance for us as a company, and that's a testimony to the four and a half thousand employees at Distel, who uh, I think represent the rich tapestry of Africa and of South Africa. And uh, we've seen their resilience, their passion, their innovation come through, uh, come through, shine through, in fact, in our results. So we've had strong double digit growth in top line revenue performance, and that we've then converted into just under 37% earnings growth. And actually, the most important indicator is our return metric, our return on invested capital. That was up 370 basis points to 16.6%. And that kind of talks to the quality of our growth. And the I think the to some extent, the successes of our strategies, particularly in Africa, our focused international business, and of course, here at home, a really strong performance from our South African business. When you look at demand, um, I suppose looking at demand from a South Africa perspective, and then uh, if you tie it in with what you're seeing from the regional perspective, where are you seeing demand when it comes to some of your brands? Uh, what are your customers or your consumers uh, liking? And what does that mean from a numbers perspective? Well, look, I think, as you know, our broad portfolio is our greatest strength. And so we span across occasions, across price, price points to mixed gender uh, consumption occasions. And of course, it's, it's all about our ready-to-drink uh, uh, cider portfolio, our wines and spirits. So 
Um, across the board, the performance has been actually really, really gratifying. So not one si single factor. I would call out Savannah, which has performed spectacularly during the period, and Amarula. Uh, again, a, 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 a heritage brand of distills, which has performed strongly around the world. Um, and then, you know, just to make the point that our portfolio is, is obviously backed up by an expanding route to market presence in Africa. And all of our core African markets have shown uh, strong growth and they went through uh, much harsher lockdown measures than perhaps we saw in South Africa where this result only saw July being affected by lockdowns. Yeah. What are you seeing from a, a CapEx point of view when you look at your investments in your, your, your digital side, your e-commerce? Because we see a lot of um, you know, companies move to that space and that space sort of was heightened, uh, I suppose, call it uh, by the response mechanism from COVID-19, where you now had to make adjustments. What are you seeing from a you know, CapEx point of view going forward when you look at your expansion of e-commerce and digital space? Yeah, so about four years ago, we put in place a multi-year program to transform our uh, customer experience digitally and obviously to put all of our platforms into the cloud. So a lot of that work has now been completed. We have actually delivered strong uh, efficiency gains through our digital platforms uh, uh, this last year. But more importantly, we're using those digital platforms to connect with more consumers directly and of course, with our customers, with very specific programs that, that help them uh, obviously appeal to their own customers in turn. So um, I think you've seen as markets have steadily opened up, consumers have gone out more readily. The, the, the on-premise and restaurant trade has started to, to pick up again. Um, but the underlying growth of direct-to-consumer um, digitally enabled uh, growth is very strong. It was over 60% in our South African business, and it was over 50% internationally. So we see uh, this trend uh, continuing uh, into the future. Perhaps COVID in some respects acted as a catalyst, but it's, it's an underlying long-term consumer shift that's taking place digitally. Depending on, on which company you look at uh, on an assay perspective, there were companies during this result season that mentioned port disruptions, whether you were talking from the mining perspective, etc. From your side, uh, what aspects of those is within your control? Because I noticed the line item where uh, port disruptions were a factor, especially when it came to your wine exports. Yeah, so look, unquestionably, I mean, there are three big factors that characterize our results. Firstly, a glass shortage, and that's not for want of effort by our largest supplier in South Africa to supply us with glass, but we had, you know, strong demand, but there was more dislocation as a result of a COVID between supply and demand that has given rise to glass shortages. So that's one big factor, and that will continue. Um, so we could have actually, you know, arguably done better than the results we've delivered uh, had we had more glass supply. And then, of course, logistics and ports uh, congestion has been a massive factor. It has got better, but it's still, I would, I would suggest, unpredictable and patchy. And if, as you know, we, we're growing in Africa, so we dependent largely either on ports or road transport, and it's been challenging. Having said that, uh, again, you know, just the, the sort of, tenacity of South Africans, you know, we turn these kind of adversities into opportunities to see how we can just, you know, perhaps respond in the most uh, proactive and positive way and just get product to, to the marketplace, which I think we've done well. Most of our viewers have been following the uh, conversations around yourself and Heineken. Where are you guys sitting right now uh, from a conversation point of view? And when can we expect, I suppose, dates uh, to be published to the market in terms of what the next step may be? So, look, I mean, the Heineken talks are obviously at the, at the phase uh, where discussions are between Heineken largely and the government, the DTI and the competition authority. The talks are constructive, they're advancing. And as we've guided, you know, um, we, we hope that uh, we'll be able to uh, provide much more information before the end of this calendar year. Yeah, and just to make the, the point that this is a good news story for South Africa, 
Uh, Heineken really have put their best foot forward, in my view, with a very competitive uh, inward investment package. Um, and so, yeah, I think uh, it's now over to our authorities, perhaps, to to assist the process and bring it to fruition by the close of this this year. Looking ahead, what will you and the rest of the team be focusing on? Are there any areas of concern, whether locally or globally? So, yeah, I think obviously the ongoing supply chain disruptions and cost inflation factors as a result of uh, the spike in commodities, oil pro in particular oil prices, is a big uh, theme for us. So, obviously, we're managing those as close as, as we can. Uh, port disruptions, logistics will continue to be a theme. Pricing and managing our price and pack architecture well, uh, a recurring theme. And then, of course, you know, for our people, um, I think, you know, we've done exceptionally well and it's keeping them inspired, motivated and, and, you know, moving forward and focused on, I think, our results, our performance and our service to our customers and consumers. That's CEO of Distel, Richard Rushton, talking to us about the company's earnings.